die Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, hosting tonight. And we're going to continue now our reading and discussion of the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. We're in the discussion of Paul's prophetic foreview of Romanism. We concluded last time on page 112 of the book. And to begin with, we'll retreat a couple of paragraphs for continuity purposes and begin in the middle of the page on page 111. We'll have one hour of reading and one hour of discussion. Hopefully we'll have some fruitful discussion tonight, questions about the, con- uh, the, uh, the content of this book. This book, it is hoped, will restore true biblical Protestantism in the United States of America before it's too late. Too many have fallen for the grand delusion. It's a strong delusion. They believe lies. And one of those is that Antichrist doesn't come until just before Christ returns. The biblical truth, the prophetic truth, the historical truth is that the Antichrist has been with us for 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years. He is the Pope of Rome. He is the God of this world, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the human agency on earth through which Satan intends to fulfill his false prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Yes, we've been lied to for generations, particularly here in the United States. Futurism as taught by the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church, was picked up by Protestants. And what it does is puts the onus of Antichrist on a single individual at the very end of time before Christ returns, approximately seven years or three and a half years, depending on which version of the lie you hold. But the fact of the matter is, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist rose to power soon after the Caesars of Rome left Rome and the power vacancy that resulted was filled by the Vatican, by the papacy. And the kings of the earth have and still do bow to him They are deceived by his false miracles, and they are deceived by his lies, and the governments of the world rule the people of the world 
by the Pope's behest. That's the literal truth. And this book proves it like no other. Now, we just mentioned the false miracles of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible calls it all power and signs and lying wonders. We're going to talk about that tonight, at least the beginning of the program. In the middle of the page, 111, we'll continue with the reading. Quote, in those days, idols could go on foot, ludes could speak, bells could ring alone, images could come down and light their own candles, dead stocks could sweat and bestir themselves, they could turn their eyes, they could move their hands, they could open their mouths, they could set bones and knit sinews, they could heal the sick and raise up the dead. Quoting further, these miracles were conveyances and subtleties, and indeed no miracles. The trunks by which they spake, the strings and wires with which they moved their faces and hands, all the rest of their treachery have been disclosed. These are the miracles of which Paul speaks, miracles in sight, in appearance, but indeed no miracles. It was also arranged that the saints could not have power to work in all places. Some wrought at Canterbury, some at Walsingham, some at York, some at Buxton, some in one place, some in another, some in the towns, and some in the fields. Even as Jeremiah said among the Jews in chapter 11, quote, according to the number of thy cities were thy gods. Unquote. Hereof grew pilgrimages and worshiping of images and kissing of relics. Hereof grew oblations and the enriching of abbeys. Every man had his peculiar saint on whom he called. Every country was full of chapels, every chapel was full of miracles, and every miracle full of lies. Another quote. These miracles are wrought by Antichrist. They are his tools, wherewith he worketh. They are his weapons, wherewith he prevaileth. They are full of lying, full of deceitfulness, and full of wickedness. So shall Antichrist prevail and rule over the world. By these miracles he shall possess the ears, the eyes, and the hearts of many and shall draw them away after him, unquote. It was alleged that miracles were not only wrought by the saints. Now let me stop and explain. In the Roman Catholic Church, saints refer to dead people, dead people that have been canonized by the Roman Catholic Church and elevated to the status of a saint. So these miracles that are said to have been uh, performed by saints, obviously you must understand, Rome claims that dead people do these miracles, and they do them through images of the saints in the Roman Catholic Church. God forbid man to consult the dead. God forbid the bowing down and worshiping and praying to images and idols. This very thing of images and idols performing miracles and dead saints performing miracles marks the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan. Make no mistake, in the Roman Catholic Church, you must be dead before you can become a saint. In the kingdom of Christ... You become a saint once you are truly saved. The saints of Jesus Christ are living. That's the difference between the living truth and the dead lies of the Roman Catholic Church. Now again, he says, it was alleged that miracles were not only wrought by the saints, but even by the relics of the saints. Now relics, if you're not familiar, 
relics are a piece of cloth or a piece of hair or a bone fragment or a skull or even an entire body of a dead Roman Catholic who has been elevated to saint, sainthood. A relic is a personal possession of that dead person or a part of his dead body encased in a shrine or a chapel. Okay? Every Roman Catholic church has some relic, and it must have a relic in it for it to be blessed by the priest. They can't even say Mass on the altar unless the chapel or the church or the cathedral is consecrated by the presence of a portion of a dead saint. All right? Now, it was alleged that miracles were not only wrought by the saints, but even by the relics of the saints. In Calvin's tractate on the subject of relics, he proves that the great majority of the relics in use among Romanists are spurious, having been wrought forward by impostors, so that every apostle is made to have three or four bodies, and every saint two or three and that the garments of Christ are almost infinite in number. As his body ascended to heaven, relics of it were not, of course, available, but spurious relics of everything he ever used or handled have been multiplied ad nauseum. Even the body of Christ has not escaped. The teeth, the hair, and the blood are exhibited in hundreds of places the manger in which he was laid at his birth, the linen in which he was swaddled, his cradle, the first shirt his mother put on him, the pillar against which he leant in the temple, the water pots that were at the marriage of Cana of Galilee, and even the wine that was made in them, the shoes that he used when he was a, when he was a boy, the table on which he observed the Last Supper, and hundreds of similar things are shown, many of them in a, number, in a number of places to this day. And as to the relics connected with our Lord's suffering and death, they are just innumerable. The fragments of the true cross scattered over the globe would, if cataloged, fill an entire volume. There's no town, however small, which has not some morsel of it, And this not only in the principal cathedral church of the district, but also in the parish churches. I'll stop and make my own personal comment. Some of the books that I've read have made such mockery of this claim of the Roman Catholic Church of having so many relics of the cross that if you gathered all of the wood together from all the relics claimed to be possessed by the Roman Catholic Church of the True Cross, you could build an entire navy of wooden ships out of it. But I'll continue with the text. There is scarcely an abbey so poor as not to have a specimen. In some places, larger fragments exist, as at Paris, Poitiers and Rome, if all the pieces which could be found were collected into a heap, they would form a good-sized shipload, though the gospel testifies that a single individual was able to carry the real cross. What effrontery then thus to fill the whole world with fragments which it would take more than 300 men to carry? In regard to the crown of thorns, it would seem that its twigs had been planted that they might grow again. Otherwise, I know not how it could attain such a size. I would never come to an end were I to go on one by one over all the absurd articles they have drawn into this service. At Rome is shown the reed, which was put into the Savior's hand as a scepter, the sponge which was offered to him containing vinegar mixed with gall, How, I ask, were those things recovered? They were in the hands of the wicked. Did they give them to the apostles that they might preserve them for relics? Or did they themselves lock them 
uh, lock them up that they might preserve them for some future period. What blasphemy to abuse the name of Christ by employing it as a cloak for such devilish fables. Among the images that Rome worships, a certain class are miraculous. The figure on the crucifix of Burgos in Spain is said to have a beard which grows perpetually, and there are similar ones in three or four other places. The stupid people believe the fable to be true. Other crucifixes are said to have spoken. A whole number. Others shed tears, as, for instance, one at Trevis and another at Orleans. From others, the warm blood flows periodically. Miraculous images of the Virgin are even more numerous, as they hold that the body of the Virgin ascended to heaven like that of her son. They cannot pretend to have her bones like those of the saints. Had it been otherwise, they would have given her a body of such size as would fill a thousand coffins. But they have made up for this lack by her hair and her milk. There's no town, however small, no monastery or nunnery, however insignificant, which does not possess some of this, some in small, others in large quantities. As John Calvin said, quote, had the breasts of the most holy virgin yielded a more copious supply than is, than is given by a cow, and had she continued to nurse during her whole lifetime, she could scarcely have furnished the quantity which is exhibited. I would fain know, he said. How is it, how it was collected so as to be preserved until our time? Luke relates the prophecy which Simeon made to the virgin, but he does not say that Simeon asked her to give him some milk, unquote. The fabrication of these relics was a lucrative trade throughout the Middle Ages, especially were dead bodies invested with sacredness by attaching to them the names of saints and of martyrs. Toulouse, for instance, thinks it possesses six bodies of the apostles James, Andrew, James the Less, Philip, Simeon, and Jude. But duplicates of these bodies are also in St. Peter's and other churches in Rome. Matthias has also another at Trevis, and there are heads and arms of him existing at different places sufficient to make up another body. What shall we say of the spirit that encourages the belief in lies and deceives men in this fashion. The degradation inflicted on the ignorant and the unlearned by these fables is terrible, as anyone who watches their effect in Ireland or on the continent is aware. Whether the miracles of the man of sin be real or pretended, true or false, it matters little. The main point is they are directed to establish falsehood. Quote, he relies for his success on the effects to be wrought in human minds by wonders and deceits accomplished in the energy of Satan, unquote. He employs wonders and deceits, a pretense to miraculous powers. Romanism has availed herself of such fraudulent practices to an enormous extent and has profited by them both financially and otherwise. But lying wonders to impose on the ignorant and superstitious masses were not the only means by which the papacy attained its power in the Middle Ages. Spurious documents, impostures of another kind, were used to influence the royal, noble, and educated classes. Principal among these were the celebrated decretal epistles, a forgery which produced the most important consequences for the papacy, though its spurious nature was ultimately detected. Gibbons writes, quote, Before the end of the 8th century, some apostolical scribe, perhaps the notorious Isidore, 
composed the decretals and the donation of Constantine, the two magic pillars of the spiritual and temporal monarchy of the popes. This memorable donation was introduced to the world by an epistle of Pope Adrian I, who exhorts Charlemagne to imitate the liberality and revive the name of the great Constantine. Their effect was enormous in advancing both the temporal power and the ecclesiastical supremacy of the popes. Now, let me just explain for those of you who have never heard of the pseudo-Isidorian decretals or the donation of Constantine. First of all, the donation of Constantine was said to have been written by Constantine the Great, you know, the restrainer that left Rome and left the papacy to rise up in his place. Yes, Constantine was said to have written with his own hand the donation of the entire world to the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome. That's right, the last Caesar of the great Roman Empire was said to have donated, just simply given to the Pope, divine right to rule the whole world by this donation of Constantine. This is the document that the papacy claims divine right to rule over the kings of the earth. It's a forgery. It's an admitted forgery. But Rome doesn't care. She keeps under the pretense that it's genuine, original, from Constantine's own hand, and it doesn't matter a whit what the whole world says. Even if they prove it to be a forgery, it still grants the papacy divine right to rule over all the kings of the earth, to rule the world by the volition of a single man, and that all the governments of the world are duty-bound, are morally bound, on pain of excommunication to obey the Pope. Then there are the pseudo-Isidorian decretals. Rome had a big project in order to prove that the Pope of Rome had direct apostolic succession from the Apostle Peter. That Peter was the first Pope and that his authority was passed down from Pope to Pope to Pope by direct contact, the laying on of hands. When the world began to question whether or not the Pope really had this so-called apostolical succession, which added to his spiritual power over men, women, and children, the people of the earth, Rome endeavored to prove. But there was a big problem, a really, really big problem. They didn't have documentation that showed the apostolical succession from Pope Adrian I all the way back to to Peter, the apostle. So they had to make it up. They had to make up centuries of history, centuries of papal history, in order to deceive the world into believing that there was direct apostolic succession between the papacy and Peter, the apostle. These are called the pseudo or false decretals. They were written by a man in the Vatican, a historian for the Pope, and he simply created history. Rome still does that today. It's one of the defining characteristics of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, you've known, you've been told what the pseudo-Isidorian decretals are. They give the Pope spiritual and temporal power over the world, the donation of Constantine, all are forgeries, admitted forgeries, proven forgeries, yet it still is the basis and foundation, the claim uttered by the papacy that he has the divine right to rule the world. Now, most people, once they've been found out to the degree that the papacy has been found out according 
uh, in, in the so-called donation of Constantine and the pseudo Isidorian decretals would just turn around red faced in embarrassment and go dig themselves a hole and bury themselves in embarrassment, but not the papacy still stands on the credibility of those documents, though they've been proven over and over and over, even by Roman Catholic historians to be not only false, but extraordinarily clumsy forgeries. Now, I'll continue where I left off. The donation of Constantine founded the one, that is, his temporal power, and the false decretals the other, that is, his spiritual power. The latter pretended to be decrees of the early bishops of Rome, limiting the independence of all archbishops and bishops by establishing a supreme jurisdiction of the Roman see in all cases and by forbidding national councils to be held without its consent. Quote, Upon these spurious decretals, says Mr. Hallam, in his History of the Middle Ages, was built the great fabric of papal supremacy over the different national churches, a fabric which has stood after its foundation crumbled beneath it. For no one has pretended to deny for the last two centuries that the imposture is too palpable for any but the most ignorant ages to credit, unquote. It is evident that then that Romanism has fulfilled this part of the prophecy of the man of sin. Even him whose coming was to be after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders and all deceivableness of unrighteousness. The power of the popes was built up on frauds and deceits of this character and has been maintained over all the nations subject to it ever since they pretend ever since by pretended miracles, spurious relics, lying wonders, and unrighteous deceits. And all these have been employed to oppose the gospel and establish falsehood. In considering the ecclesiastical aspect of Romanism, we must never lose sight that it is the outcome and climax of the predicted apostasy whose features Paul describes in Timothy. We must close this lecture with a few remarks on the departure from the faith which, which occupies so prominent a place in that description. Some should, quote, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, unquote. The faith must, of course, here be taken in a broad sense as including all the doctrines and commandments of the Christian religion. The apostasy was to be marked by a departure from this faith, by the teaching of false doctrines, and the inculcation of anti-scriptural practices. That popery is completely at variance with the Bible on all the important points of the faith of Christ may be safely asserted and can be abundantly proved. We can select but a few of the principal points. Number one, the Apostle Paul teaches that the Holy Scriptures are able to make us, quote, wise unto salvation, unquote, that they are capable of rendering the man of God, quote, truly furnished, unquote, and James speaks of engrafting word of God as, quote, able to save the soul, unquote. The true doctrine, therefore, is that scripture contains all that is necessary for salvation. Let me read it again. The true doctrine, therefore, is that Scripture contains all that is necessary for salvation. Now understand, salvation is not through the churches, as is taught in the Roman Catholic Church and even the so-called Protestant churches today. 
salvation is of the Lord. And Scripture is what saves us. Scripture, the Word of God, makes us wise unto salvation, able to save the soul. Now he continues, what is the doctrine of Romanism on this point? One of the articles of the Council of Trent asserts that not only should the Old and New Testaments be received with reverence as the Word of God, but also, also, quote, the written traditions which have come down to us pertaining both to faith and manners and preserved in the Catholic Church, and I will add the word alone, because that's what they believe and teach, which have been preserved in the Catholic Church by continual succession. Unquote. In considering this decree and its fatal effects on the exalting, in exalting mere human traditions to the level of divine revelation, one is reminded of the solemn words which close the apocalypse. Quote, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Unquote. Christ taught, on the contrary, that tradition was to be rejected whenever it was opposed to Scripture. Quote, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Unquote. Quote, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Unquote. And further, quote, Laying aside the commandments of God, Ye hold the tradition of men, unquote. And finally, quote, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, unquote. Number two, again, the Bible teaches us the duty of reading and searching the scriptures. The Lord Jesus himself said, quote, search the scriptures, unquote. But Romanism forbids the general reading of Scripture, asserting that such a use of the Word of God in the vulgar tongue causes more harm than good, and that it must never be practiced except by special permission in writing obtained from a priest. If any presume to read it without that, they are not to receive absolution. Booksellers who sell the Bible to any desiring to obtain it are to have penalties inflicted upon them, and no one is to purchase a Bible without special license from their superior. This is extended to receiving a gift of the Bible. Number three, the true faith teaches us that every man is bound to judge for himself as to the meaning of Scripture. Quote, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, unquote. And further, quote, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, unquote. But the Council of Trent decrees that, quote, no one confiding in his own judgment shall dare to twist the the sacred scriptures to his own sense of them, contrary to that which is held by the Holy Mother Church, whose right it is to judge of the meaning, unquote. If anyone disobeys this decree, he is to be punished according to the law. Number four, Scripture teaches us most abundantly that Christ is the only head of the church. God gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, But Romanism teaches that the Pope is the head of the church on earth. Quote, the Pope is the head of all heads, and the prince, moderator, and pastor of the whole church of of Christ, which is under him, unquote, says Pope Benedict XIV. And the Douay Catechism, taught in all papal schools, says, quote, he who is not in due connection and subordination to the Pope must needs be dead and cannot be counted a member of the church, unquote. 
Number five, Scripture teaches us that the wages of sin is death, and that, quote, whoever shall keep the law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all, unquote. And, and further, quote, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, unquote. But popery teaches that there are some sins which do not deserve the wrath or the curse of God, and that venial sins do not bring spiritual death to the soul. Number six, the Bible teaches us that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, and that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But popery denounces this doctrine. The Council of Trent asserts that whosoever shall affirm that we are justified by the grace and favor of God was to be accursed. And so all those who hold that salvation is not by works, but by grace. Number seven. Scripture teaches us to confess sin to God only. Quote, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, unquote. And, quote, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God, unquote. Another quote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, unquote. But Romanism denies this and says that sacramental confession to a priest is necessary to salvation, and that anyone who should denounce the practice of secret confessions as contrary to the institution and command of Christ and a mere human invention is to be accursed. Number eight. Scripture teaches us again that God only can forgive sins, and that the minister's duty is simply to announce his forgiveness. Quote, repentance and remission of sins, unquote, was to be preached in his name among all nations. Quote, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, unquote. He commanded us to preach to the people that, quote, through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, unquote. But the Council of Trent asserts, on the contrary, whosoever shall affirm that the priest's absolution is not a judicial act, but only a ministry to declare that the sins of the penitent are forgiven, or that the confession of the penitent is not necessary in order to obtain absolution from the priest, let him be accursed. Number nine. Scripture teaches us that no man is perfectly righteous and that certainly that no one can do more than his duty to God. Quote, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, unquote. And, quote, in thy sight shall no man living be justified, unquote. Quote, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do, unquote. But the Council of Trent, on the contrary, asserts that the good works of the just, the good works of the justified man his fasts, alms, and penances really deserve increase of grace and eternal life, and that God is willing, on account of his most pious servants, to forgive others. It teaches that a man may do more than is requisite and may give the overplus of his good works to another. Now let me make a comment. This is, understood, this is misunderstood by many people. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary and the saints were so virtuous that they performed more, many more good works than were necessary to save themselves 
and that the overplus of their good works, the surplus of their good works, the extra grace that they earned (laughs) is stored in a bank somewhere, an invisible bank somewhere, and it's overflowing with extra grace earned by Mary and the saints of the Roman Catholic Church and the apostles and all the patriarchs of the Bible, and all of that grace is held in a big, invisible savings account, and the Pope's got the key. So if you come to the Pope and you've committed a grievous sin like many of the Popes has, like incest or murder or regicide or, well, let's just leave it there. If you pay enough money, the Pope can get his secret little key and unlock that bank of grace, that invisible bank of grace, and make a withdrawal in your behalf and credit that grace to you. And not only to cover sins that you've committed in the past, but to commit any sin you want to commit in the future, too. It's called an indulgence. And it is absolutely diabolical. Absolutely diabolical. It was the very thing that brought about the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was so incensed. Martin Luther, even though he were a Catholic, a monk in the Roman Catholic Church, had bound on threat of excommunication to believe that those indulgences were perfectly lawful, he rebelled and announced to the whole world what an incredible sin indulgences were. And that that alone was enough to spark the Protestant Reformation. All he did was tell the truth, and he let the chips fall where they may, and as a result of the Protestant Reformation that came out of the controversy having to do with indulgences, all of Europe was liberated. Nearly all of Europe was liberated from papal tyranny. But guess what? We've forgotten the Protestant Reformation. Protestantism is almost dead in this country. Nobody can tell you, nobody in the non-Roman Catholic churches can tell you what indulgences were. They couldn't even tell you what Martin Luther was all about. They can't even tell you what Protestantism represents, though they call themselves Protestants. Or many who are even ashamed to call themselves Protestants today might just call themselves evangelical or the emerging church or some other name. But we owe a lot to the truth. We owe a lot to Martin Luther and we need to return to the faith of Protestantism. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. Protestant because it protests Antichrist. It protests the papacy. It protests the Roman Catholic Church. It protests the Vatican. It protests false miracles. It protests indulgences. It protests priest pedophilia. It protests a diabolical history of the popes, the sins committed by that church. It protests the crusades, the inquisitions, the martyrs, of Jesus, whose blood has been shed for centuries now at the hands of this man of sin who calls himself the replacement of Jesus Christ on the earth. Now, number nine. Scripture teaches us that no man is perfectly righteous and certainly that none can do more than his duty to God If we say we have no sin, we've deceived ourselves. 
In thy sight, no man can be, no man living be justified. When ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. But the counsel of Trent, on the contrary, asserts that the good works of the justified man, his fasts, his alms, and penances, really deserve increase of grace and eternal life, and that God is willing, on account of his most pious servants, to forgive others. It teaches that a man may do more than is requisite and may give the overplus of his good works to another. That's a lie. All of it, every word of it is a lie. Number 10, the scripture teaches us that faith in Christ removes sin and its guilt. Quote, that the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world, unquote, that by his death Christ put away our sins, that, quote, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, unquote. But Romanism teaches that the venial sins of the believers have to be expiated by a purgatory after death and that the prayers of the faithful can help them. The creed of Pope Pius IV contains the clause, quote, I constantly hold that there is a purgatory and that the souls detained therein are helped by the suffrages of the faithful, unquote. Another diabolical teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that after you die, you live on. And that if you have unconfessed sins that you have not confessed to a Roman Catholic priest and obtained absolution from a Roman Catholic priest, after having done so many penances or paid so much money, you must go to purgatory where you writhe in flames of torture for perhaps millions of years, and that during that time, in order to shorten your time in purgatory and the pains and sufferings of the flames, that your family in perpetuity must make financial contributions to the church so that the priest may say masses in your behalf and that grace may be infused and that your term, your sentence in purgatory might be shortened. And then, only then, can you go to heaven. All power and signs and lying wonders. Contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything that is holy. Number 11. Scripture teaches us that, quote, by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, unquote. That he was once offered to bear the sins of many. But Romanism asserts, on the contrary, that in each of the endlessly repeated masses in its innumerable churches all over the world, there is offered to God, quote, a true, proper, and propitiatory sacrifice for the living and the dead. Let me read it again. This is Roman Catholic canon law, that in the Mass, the little Jesus cookie, which they magically turn into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and then sacrifice him once again on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church, that that is a true proper, and propitiatory sacrifice. In other words, it it washes away your sins. It reconciles you to God. And it is performed before both the living and the dead. So now you see what purgatory was for. So that people would continually pay the church to say masses for your dead relatives in perpetuity. To make billions and billions of dollars. 
why the Roman Catholic Church is the most wealthy institution on the planet. Now, never mind those who say, oh, the priests are poor, they're out panhandling, ringing their bells and clinking their cups and begging for quarters and pennies and dimes. Listen, if the world has been so deceived by all of these other clearly anti-scriptural teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, don't think for a minute that Rome's truly poor. Look at these teachings and the potential for revenue gathering, filthy lucre, and you just simply have to understand that the Roman Catholic Church is beyond question the most wealthy institution on the planet. And, buddy, let me tell you, where there's money, there's power. Money is power in this godless world. And whoever has the most money has the most power. Enough power to rule the world. Enough power to threaten entire nations if they do not obey the papacy. The wars of the world are fought on ill-gotten gains of the Roman Catholic Church. Number 12, Scripture, as we've already shown, teaches us that the marriage of the ministers of Christ is a lawful and honorable thing. Peter was a married man. Paul asserts his liberty to marry and says that a bishop must be the husband of one wife, having his children in subjection with all gravity, and that the deacons also must be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their houses well. Romanism, on the other hand, teaches, quote, that the clergy may not marry and that marriage is to them a pollution, unquote. Forbidding to marry. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Number 13, Scripture says, quote, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve, unquote. Barnabas and Paul, with horror, forbade the crowds to worship them. And the angel similarly forbade John, saying, See thou do it not. Romanism enjoins or encourages or forces the worship of both angels and saints and their relics. Quote, The saints reigning together with Christ are to be honored and invocated. They offer up prayers to God for us, and their relics are to be venerated, unquote. Doctrines of Deeds. Number 14. The Bible again teaches that images are not to be worshipped. Quote, thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them, unquote. Quote, I am the Lord. My glory will I not give to another neither my praise to graven images, unquote. But Romanism teaches her votaries to say, quote, I most firmly assert that the images of Christ and the mother of God, Mary, ever virgin, and also the other saints, are to be had and retained, and that due honor and veneration are to be given to them, unquote. All power and signs and lying wonders. Deceivableness of unrighteousness. This is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. God marked the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan in the Bible. There's no mistake. It's not a joke. It's not a twisting of words. It's God's clear definition of the Antichrist Church And we see it from the very words of the Roman Catholic Church, the very words that God wrote in the Scriptures to describe her. Is anyone to credibly doubt that the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy is that which was predicted, the great apostasy, the grand delusion 
the strong delusion that the world would believe the lie that the Pope is the vicar, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and has the divine right to change God's laws. Number 15, and above all, Scripture teaches us that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other. But Romanism teaches that there are other mediators in abundance besides Jesus Christ, that the Virgin Mary and all the saints are such, quote, the saints reigning together with Christ offer prayers to God for us, unquote. I must not go further and contrast Bible and Romish teachings on the subject of the Lord's Supper, extreme unction, and a multitude of other points, but may say in a word that there is not a doctrine of the gospel which has not been contradicted or distorted by this Roman Catholic system and that it stands branded before the world beyond all question as fulfilling Paul's prophecy of the the apostasy, the apostasy, that it should be characterized by departure from the faith. Perhaps I cannot give you a better idea of the distinctive teachings of Romanism as to controverted points of doctrine than by reading to you the creed of Pope Pius IV. This creed was adopted at the famous Council of Trent held in the 16th century when the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation were already widely diffused through Europe and joyfully accepted and held by the young Protestant churches of many lands. The Council of Trent was indeed Rome's reply to the Reformation. That's why it is called the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent. The newly recovered truths of the gospel were in its canons and decrees stigmatized as pestilential heresies, and all who held them accursed. And in opposition to them, this creed was prepared and adopted. It commences with the Nicene Creed, which is common to Romanists and Protestants, but to this simple and ancient form of sound words, it adds 12 new articles which are familiar and peculiar to Rome and contain her definite rejection of the doctrines of Scripture recovered at the Protestant Reformation. And I only have four minutes left in the broadcast, so I'm going to stop here. And you are free to let the suspense get to you and go to archives.org, Romanism and the Reformation, University of Toronto, and read beginning on page 128 this, this creed of, dare I say it, the Antichrist of the Bible. It's an Antichrist creed written by the Antichrist, perpetuated by every Antichrist who has reigned since him and is still the creed of the Roman Catholic Church today. And none of us need to be doubtful as to who Antichrist is. God does not deal treacherously with his people. He wants to save us. He wanted to save us so bad that he gave up his own life for us, suffered a cruel death on the cross for us. Why in God's name, as is taught in all the churches today, Why is it that we should not know who the Antichrist is until just before Christ returns? I'll tell you why. To make cover for the papacy, the true biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, 
who has fulfilled all the prophecies of Scripture regarding Antichrist. And we've never been told. Not by our pastors, not by our parents, not by the press, not by the seminaries, not by the presidents, not by the Congress, not by anybody. Why? Because it is the most closely held secret on the planet. You see, Satan rules this world, and he wants us all to be deceived. And we are deceived. It's time for us to get undeceived. There is a biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist in the Bible. It's only news to us in this generation who it is. All the Protestant reformers knew it, and every true Bible-believing Christian prior to the Protestant Reformation. Do you realize that throughout history, true Bible-believing men of God proclaimed the papacy to be the Antichrist of the Bible? You simply have to ask yourself, if you call yourself a Christian and you don't believe this, how is it that you don't believe it? And what consequence does it have in your eternal destiny? Okay, thanks for listening. My name's Tom Fress. I'm the host of Inquisition Update, heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central on www.firstamendmentradio.com. If you'd like to email me, my email address is tom at cwaves.us.